Hey everyone and welcome to another instalment of board games I got rid of and why. So in this series I talk through 10 board games that I used to own but for one reason or another no longer do and I tried to give some rationale as to why I came to that decision. Uh, before I get talking about these 10 games I want to give a shout out to the show's sponsor Kienda. .co.uk, who are my go-to online retailer here in the UK. And if you use my discount code in the show notes, you can get 5% off your first order and help the channel when you do so. But without further ado, let's get started on the first game. So the first game I'm talking about this episode is Kariba, which is a small box card game by Dr. Reiner Knizia. This game is Feather Light, it's probably one of the lightest games I've had in my collection for a long time, or did have for a long time. Uh, this game is a very simple game where you're trying to play these cards out and this wheel system. So each of these cards represents a different animal and they all have a different number assigned to them. So the bigger the animal, the bigger the number essentially. But what you're doing is you can play any number of cards of the same type on this wheel um, in their pre-allocated space. And as soon as a third animal of a type or three or more animals are played, then you're going to take all the cards of the next smallest animal. So if you say you played three eights, you'll grab all the available sevens on that wheel. Um, however, if there were no sevens, then you'd go and eat the sixes and so on. So this is kind of a game where you've got to be very careful about what you leave your opponents because sometimes you'll play a couple of eights down and then they'll eat the, you know, the next animal down and then somebody will play the ones which will loop back around and eat all the eights. So you want to be playing animals but not leaving too great of opportunities for your opponents to gobble the animals that you've just played as well. So it has that constant back and forth. That's pretty much what the game consists of. Every single animal you collect is going to be a victory point. And this is definitely one of those games that, depending on the player count, the experience is vastly different. So in a, um, in a three or four player game, it's a lot more chaotic. You can't really predict about what people are going to do. But in a two player game, believe it or not, this game is actually quite tactical and pretty interesting because it's this constant goading, trying to lure people into trapping your animals so you can trap them with other ones and get these constant kind of chain reactions really to benefit yourself. So actually more here than meets the eye when it comes to that two player count. However, if I am going to play a two player game, I'm probably going to play something you know, especially designated for two players um, because there are so many great ones out there which meant that Karibu was kind of pushed to the wayside and again if I am looking for that three or four player count and I want a very short snappy game then this one just isn't quite as good as some of the others just because of its chaotic nature. The second game I'm talking about is New York Zoo by Uwe Rosenberg and like a lot of Rosenberg games this is a polyomino you know, Tetris style game which you're trying to fill up your board representing a zoo in this case with tiles representing the animal enclosures but the the kind of twist on this game was that you could actually acquire these animal meeples and put them on these tiles um, and if you ever have two of the same animal inside an enclosure when you reach these certain checkpoints on this rondelle where you're drafting the tiles from then they're going to breed and multiply and once one of these enclosures is full with the same type of animal you get a bonus tile to fill up your board even quicker and then it's a race to complete your board by having every single square filled in so it does have that race aspect which i did like about the game to be honest um i did appreciate that other mechanism that tried to differentiate itself i.e you know the breeding mechanism but i did think it was enough to stand out on its own and in the kind of actuality of the game when you are physically playing it Having so many meeples on your player board became very fiddly. It was certainly a, um, a busy game, you know, meeples everywhere, um, just very cluttered, I suppose, is what I'm trying to say. And little things like that do tend to grate on me. I don't really enjoy, you know, fiddly style games um, because, again, I find them quite annoying. Um, but the gameplay was decent. I did like the game. I didn't love it, that's for sure. And, you know, if I'm completely honest, a lot of other people I played this with enjoyed it way more than I do. So maybe give it some, you know, give it some benefit of the doubt in that respect. The next game I'm talking about is Tabanusi Builders of Ur, which at the time of this recording is the most recent game from the Board and Dice T series, which included um, games such as Teo Teo Khan and Tekenyu. Tabanusi had the same kind of vibe, it had the same visuals and aesthetic. Um, however, I thought the gameplay wasn't so intuitive as the other design. So in this one, you were kind of placing tiles and buildings to try and get like area majorities and stuff like that. Um, and I think the main focus of this game was to try and be more interactive than those other titles I mentioned were. And I think, uh, at least in, you know, in my personal um, opinion, this game did reach a bit too far to be different, to the point where it was just a bit confusing 
the rules were a bit clunky and it just didn't all seem to kind of fit together. It felt like a bit of a mishmash of mechanisms and it was a bit like putting a, you know, like a square peg in a round hole. It was just, again, it just didn't click or resonate for me. I wanted to like it and there were certainly some redeemable features here, but ultimately it was just a, a busy bunch of mechanisms that were just mashed together and it just didn't flow very well. And I don't think it quite reached the pedigree or the, the standard of those other games I mentioned. So definitely the first game of this series that was a big miss for me. And it's a bit of a shame to do that because I'm not saying this is a, a, you know, a terrible game, but compared to the great standard of, of those other games, this one was just nowhere near that, not, not even in the same stratosphere, if I'm completely honest. So yeah, sadly, um, I think this one, doesn't really deserve your attention it's just um it's just too much going on and it's trying to be too different um not to its benefits the next game i'm talking about is progress evolution of technology which is a pretty streamlined and stripped back civilization style game as you are building up a nation from bare bones um trying to get more and more cards to get your little sieve more sophisticated and getting points as you're doing so so this game has some pretty cool tech trees as you would um, acquire basic cards and there would be prerequisites for other cards and so on to the point where you're getting to, you know, basically um, modern day technology such as the internet and stuff like that. And it was quite cool to see that, get that progress, I suppose, from, from those real basic um, technologies. Now, when I initially played this, I was very impressed because I thought it flowed very nicely. The card play was cool. Um, that kind of multi-use card system where you'd spend cards to pay for other ones. It all worked completely well and um, as it should. Now, I suppose why it's dropped off a bit for me since then is because the game arc was a bit lacking because essentially when you are in that third or fourth age where you are getting to the more, get more modern technologies, you are essentially still playing the same game as if you were in the in the first stage. So although the you know the thematics and the illustrations and the card are different and more modern, you know, if you're if you're if you know if you're being honest with yourself, you are just playing the same game and doing the same mechanism. So it would have been nice if they um, started introducing more mechanisms as the game went on, just to make it feel different. And I don't think it did that to a high standard. But despite that, I did like the game. You know, if you want a very simple Civ game that plays in about an hour, this is definitely one to look at, especially if you do like, do like card driven games. But ultimately for me, I think the replayability and the incentive to come back to it wasn't quite there for me. The next game I'm talking about is Four Seasons, which is a small box filler game with an I split you choose mechanism, which to be honest, I don't really often see. Uh, so this game, you are gonna have a hand of cards and these cards are absolutely gorgeous to look at. You're gonna put a pair of them in front of your opponent and then your opponent is gonna pick one of those cards to put in front of them, almost as like a bid, and they're gonna put the other card in the center of the table, which is gonna show the amount of points that you're bidding for. And all these cards are gonna come in different suits, so there's got this real kind of delicate balancing act where, yeah, I'm gonna increase the, um, the worth of this type of card, but I'm gonna increase my bid in this type. And it's all about how you're going to split that and how you're going to divide that out. And as the game goes on and on and on, your options are gonna get more and more limited, meaning that you have to be quite careful about what you're giving your opponent. And you have to give them um, things that is going to be almost like the best of a bad choice, if that makes sense. It's all about damage mit uh, mitigation and limitation, I suppose. Um, and I like pretty much everything about this game. Um, the setup was a little bit annoying, but other than that, the gameplay I thought was really solid. So why have I got rid of this game? Simply because I have another game that I think does the Ice Split You Choose thing much better than for Seasons Dirt. The game I'm talking about is Hanamakoji. So if you watch my content, I've kind of raved about Hanamakoji for years and years now. I think it's one of the best two player games out there and it's definitely the most refined um, version of an ice split you choose mechanism I've ever seen. And I can't really see anything, anything else trumping it um, at least you know, anytime soon. So when a game is kind of fighting for the same niche, you know, small, fast, two player, I split you choose games. I don't really need two of them. Hannah Mikoji was better, therefore Four Seasons had to go. The next game I'm talking about is Whirling Witchcraft, which was a game I actually really wanted to like because I thought the concept was cool and it's certainly a unique idea and something, you know, something different. So in this game, you are essentially trying to overwhelm your opponents by 
using these cubes to convert into other cubes, chucking them into a cauldron and then passing them on. However, whenever you can't process cubes, you're gonna put them on your player board and once these um, player sheets build up a certain amount of times, the game is gonna end and you're going to you know, win by forcing an opponent not, not to be able to deal with what you're giving them. So I thought that was quite cool, you know, a different level of interaction, just trying to flush things into your opponent's system that you know they can't process. And the way you end up um, gaining these cards is through like a drafting system. So, you know, if you're really struggling with blue cubes, you want to try and get something that will get rid of those blue cubes and maybe convert them into other things. So yeah, loved the idea of this one. However, another one where in reality, I thought that it was very um, anticlimactic because you were only ever really dealing with the player to your left and to your right. Um, and despite, you know, being a great thing that you can cater to a higher player count in this game, it felt like, if um, if the game was ended by somebody from the other side of the table, it was like, well, that was completely out of your hands. You had no control over that whatsoever. And um, it feels very like underwhelming when it ends that way because you know there's nothing you could do about that. So I thought that was a bit disengaging really. And I felt like if you had somebody who wasn't so efficient um, sat next to you, you are gonna be at a significant advantage than if you're next to two really savvy players. So I thought when a game is that dependent on who you're playing with, um, it just felt a little bit weak for me and was certainly a negative point from the game that I wasn't quite willing to overcome. The next game I'm talking about is Micro Macro Crime City. So this game did reach immense popularity when it came out and it continues to do really well with its follow-up expansions. But this game, you know, we talk about games being unique. This one truly is unique. It did completely carve out a niche for itself um, in the board game space. As you are essentially playing a cooperative game of, you know, where's Wally or where's Waldo. Um, however, you are trying to solve a crime when doing so. So you're going to play on this huge sheet of this kind of a, a cityscape, I suppose. And in the city, you're going to have a bunch of these micro drawings where a bunch of crimes are going to be taking place. And you've got kidnappings, you've got burglaries, um, you know, robberies, uh, murders. And you're trying to find these crime scenes and solve how they've taken place, you know, who the culprits are by looking at the fine details of the drawings. But the cool thing about these um, images are that it's not like a snapshot in time. It's basically a timeline of the um, of the event. So you can actually trace where these characters have been if you follow them up accordingly, which I think is so genius. And this is a game that I thought was an absolute delight to play. Um, played the whole thing from start to finish, enjoyed pretty much every single mission. Some are better than others, um, but yeah, they're all good and they're all a good experience. Um, and the reason this one left the collection was simply because I've done it all. You know, I played every single mission. I want no reason to keep it around anymore. Um, create a bit of space for something new. Just, you know, leave with a very positive experience and move on to the next thing. And to be completely honest, I've not even had that massive desire to try any of the expansions because I don't want them to deteriorate in quality at all because I have such a good impression of this one. The next game I'm talking about is Deep Sea Adventure, which is a pretty popular push your luck game by Oink Games. And in this game, you are a bunch of um, divers and you are trying to dive as deep as you can into the ocean to get to the best treasure because the best treasure has the most victory points assigned to it. However, as soon as anybody picks up a piece of treasure, the shared air supply starts to run out. And if you do not make it back to the submarine in time, then you're gonna lose all that precious loot and leave with nothing. So this is all about how far can you push, not to be too greedy, but be greedy enough so you get the best stuff, um, but all being kind of cognizant of the air supply running out. And I tend to really enjoy pushy luck games. Um, you know, I have my favorites, I thought this was a good one. I don't think it was a great one, especially as I started to play it more and more times. I thought you were a little bit too dependent on what the other players um, do in this one, because as soon as anybody picks up a piece of treasure, you're pretty much forced to, um, you know, cut your losses and run. It's not like there's that huge incentive to keep going, because if you do, you're pretty much guaranteed not to make it back in time, because it, you are so slow and plodding to make it back to the submarine. Um, so yeah, I love the concept of it. it. It's definitely a fun game to explain to people and they're gonna get it straight away because the theme and the mechanisms do work well together. But ultimately I think there's better push it up games where you can take the responsibility yourself rather than being so dependent on the other players. So I thought while the um, while that shared air supply works and it's definitely one of the cool things about this game, I think the way it affected the actual gameplay was a bit limiting at times. The next game I'm talking about is Mafiozu 
by Rudiger Dorn. So this game actually uses the mechanism that Rudiger Dorn is most known for, you know, used in games such as Istanbul, Genoa, uh, and Robber Knights, um, where you normally have a stack of discs and then you are depositing them off in different locations to try and increase your influence. In this one, you're doing something very similar, but you have these gems instead, and you're using these gems to try and control these different characters because these characters will give you different rewards if you have the most gems of your colour on them at the end of the round. You're going to use those things or those, use those rewards to claim these buildings, which will give you little powers and end game points. And of course, everybody's trying to trump you by donating more gems than you do. Um, I like the flow of this one. I thought it has some cool concepts. You know, I love the idea of taking that traditional Dawn mechanism mixed with some area control. Um, certainly felt like there was a lot of potential here. Um, however, I thought after a few plays, um, I thought it was a bit disappointing the fact that this game was not modular in terms of the setup. This was like could have easily been variable by having you know tiles that you could shift around each game, but they were all just drawn directly onto the board, so therefore every game was going to feel somewhat the same, which I thought was a missed opportunity to be honest. Now I am aware that this game is a re-implementation of a, another game called Louis XIV, which is one I actually still want to try because I think I might like that version more than this one, simply because I believe it is variable. I also did feel that there's a couple of mechanisms that didn't really need to be there in this game in the form of collecting these additional tokens where you're trying to build up these sets. Felt a little bit too lucky and a bit too swingy for me because most of the time you were just picking them up blindly. But still, almost there for me, definitely a near miss. Some cool artwork, um, some good mechanisms, but ultimately the final package wasn't quite strong enough for those negative reasons. And the final game I'm talking about this episode is Corrosion. So Corrosion is definitely one of those games I've had a strange relationship with um, since knowing about it because I was very um, keen to play this one because I love the idea of it. Um, you know, I love engine building games and this game is all about engine building. And this idea that this engine you're building is not gonna be permanent fascinated me because the more you run things in this game, you end up losing things from your machine, meaning that you have to keep replenishing them to keep things ticking along most efficiently. That for me just ticks a lot of boxes and is pretty much exactly what I'm looking for. And I have to say the gameplay in this game is fantastic. There's so many cool things you can do, little engines you can build, not being able to put too strong of an engine because you need to replace things. Um, yeah, lots to like here. Um, however, there was one glaring issue with the game, and that was the amount of time it took. Because this game wasn't exactly a heavy, complex game. You know, you're talking medium weight here. And this game took about two hours to play. Um, and for me, that was a bit too long from the experience you got from it. You know, you play probably 30% of the game past the point you were almost ready to pack up. And for me, that is like a big red flag. It's something I try to stay away from as much as possible. But initially, I was kind of willing to look past that and forgive it because I did enjoy the gameplay that much. Um, but the more I played it, um, that became harder and harder for me to ignore. Now, the designer did come out um, publicly and provide a variant on how to speed the game along and make it feel faster without um, altering the balance of the game. And I did try that variant. And even with that, it still felt too long, too slow and too plodding. So it just it just didn't quite strike the balance of having the right end game trigger for the game, in my opinion. And it could have just used a little bit more development because I thought this game has a lot of potential. And if there's ever a game out there that could do with a second edition, then um, Corrosion would be right up there on that list for me um, personally. So there we have it. Those are another 10 games that have left my collection. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you have, please be sure to hit like, comment and subscribe to my channel. Uh, for everyone else, I'll see you next time on Chairman of the Board. Bye bye.